Ok, Benedetto Croci, no, allora, Massimiliano Croci, um, I, I've been there only a couple of weeks ago, so that video is just making it, I've been knowing Croci for a while, like four or five years, mainly due to my, my colleague and friend Gaetano, he's my personal pusher, <laughs> he's, he travels more than I do, so he's more in touch with, uh, you know, with, with new trends and new winemakers that are coming out and so on. Most of the times, the, the new winemakers that are like most are not new at all. Uh, they become new in the sense that uh, they are, you know, they, they are more known. Um, Massimiliano Croce to me represents the ideal uh, approach to winery because it's uh, a natural way of making wine, but not based on the trend, but based on his tradition. He's been making wine in the same way for more than... 40, 50 years, probably even more. Uh, he's like the last member of the generation. He's only 38 years old. He started when he was 18. He took the place of his father only recently. And his family has been making wine in the same place in a beautiful area, um, Piacenza, that is like Tuscany, but with no tourism. It's absolutely amazing. We, I had one of the best meals of my life there in a beautiful trattoria. They are probably coming here, the chef with the winemaker, they're coming here in October. We're gonna do a, ah, sorry. This is because it was a bit warm. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> That's what we do. Good luck. Uh, wash the glasses. I'm messing up everything. But so the the wine here is called um, Croce is the wine. Real Fiere is the type of wine. This is a rosé. In the wine, in the tier one and two, you have the white and the red. Uh, which is uh, the same wine, but the first one is uh, mainly Ortrugo. Ortrugo is the grape variety. Here you have also a bit of uh, of um, of Bonarda, which is the local Barbera. And uh, so we are in between Piedmont and Puglia. Uh, sorry, Piedmont and uh, and and Emilia Romagna and Piedmont. I'm gonna show it to you. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, allora, Colli Piacentini is here. Okay, there is. Uh, Allora, see, this is Lombardy, this is Emilia Romagna, and uh, here is Piedmont. So you are exactly in between these three regions, and I also Liguria has not so far, okay? Why I'm actually saying that? Because this is a crossroad, a crossroad of flavors and type of way making wines. Here you make light sparkling, like Lambrusco. Don't make jokes about Lambrusco, but Lambrusco can be incredibly good. I'm gonna put it on the wine club just to punish you for thinking that Lambrusco is not a good one. Uh, I know that there's a lot of Brusco that is produced that is terrible. Piedmont, which makes like heavier, more consistent one type of wines, and the Lambrusco. And in between, you have a wine that is called the Guturnio. Sooner or later, I'm gonna put it on the wine club. In this case, we're talking about their, actually, their sparkling, but the Guturnio is exactly in between a, a Lambrusco and a Barbera. Because Barbera is slightly heavier, like Barambusco is slightly uh, is lighter, and Guturno is a naturally sparkling type of wine with a bit of a consistency of the Bonarda, that is the local name of the Barbera. Okay, uh, when you, in this case, we're talking about uh, uh, a sparkling that he makes in the colder vintages. So when he have some grape variety that is a kind of a high acidity, once a one a while he makes this bottle. He makes only nine hundred bottles, so we bought six hundred. So we own the winery, this type of bottle. So this is actually made mainly only for the wine club, okay? Uh, when you talk about a sparkling wine, you mainly talk about a wine that is uh, made with a technique, okay? Uh, how do you do make a sparkling? You put some sugar and some yeast in the bottle, the yeast and the sugar release the alcohol and the CO2, and here it comes. So it's an artificial process uh, that allows the winemaker to change the flavor of the wine, no matter, you know, even if he has not a good grape, the basic one. So a lot of sparkling nowadays are a way to get rid of the leftovers of the grapes. Um, it comes out like, you know, it pops up like mushrooms all the time. You know, there is this winemaker and oh, I also have the sparkling. What is the sparkling? He doesn't know how to make a sparkling. He just make it because he has some leftovers and you can easily adjust the flavor with a lot of yeast. So my policy from now on, unless we talk about some Grand Cru from Champagne, and it has always been like this, all the wines, all the sparkling wines we put in our wine club are only or naturally fermented or padosé. So it means that they don't do the second, uh, the second fermentation. 
Uh, I don't want to explain too much. You can check it every. We can see the video. Croce is going to tell it to you. What does it mean? But it is about wines where the bubbles are actually made with the natural fermentation in the bottle without using any extra yeast and extra sugar. Sometimes it's the second fermentation. We're talking about here the first fermentation. So the way this wine is made, they put some young wine, non-fermented wine in the bottle, usually around 10%. This wine restarts the fermentation that we have the bubbles, which is not easy to control. And, in, and, and no, there's no industry that can do something like that because it takes you know, a lot of time. Uh, but th this is, in my opinion, if you don't have if you don't have the technique and the artisan capacity of a champagne wine maker with their acidity, that's the only way to make a, a, a sparkling that smells and tastes of the grape where it's coming from and not just of the yeast. I don't know if you can smell this in beautiful purity type of wine. In this case, you have a bit of a metallic flavor at the end with a slightly, slightly jammy. Uh, strawberry but not too strong on the white version of the rosé the wine is even more clean this is a bit more complex for tier two also more expensive the other one is actually more linear this could go all day all dinner doesn't matter if it is an aperitif a mid uh, lunch or the end of the dinner or the middle of the middle of the dinner it could go with the aperitif it could go with uh, the, the ideal to me is like a, a red fish soup uh, if you can I don't know if it's your tradition to make it but this is a perfect pairing for a red fish soup. Cheers.